China's far west has long been a place of mystery, isolation, great beauty, and at times, threat. Where we're heading, politics, religion, and identity have been combining to produce a murderous result. Hundreds have died over the past year following violent clashes. The government blames the bloodshed on independence-seeking ethnic Uyghurs who've lived in this tough landscape for generations. We're delving into one of the most sensitive matters in China today. We pass the old border post and enter Xinjiang. Next to Pakistan and Afghanistan, it's more than one and a half million square kilometres, mostly made up of dramatic sprawling desert with the occasional oasis. Immediately, you come across paramilitary police and SWAT teams. Cars pulled over, identification documents registered. Reporters haven't been able to get to the bottom of events here because of the many places to which we can't get access. We're attempting to cross the province to try and find out what's been causing the tension and the killing. President Xi Jinping's China is becoming more hardline right across the country. Here it's extreme, though some would say with good reason. Last year, a team of jihadists from Xinjiang planned to strike an iconic location. They were after a shocking image to go round the world. A car was driven into a crowd in front of Beijing's Tiananmen Gate, killing and maiming as it went. Said to be a suicide mission, the vehicle burst into flames, with a Uyghur man, his wife and mother-in-law all inside. Yet the majority of violence has happened inside Xinjiang. Just about every month, there's a new report of a police station being raided, or civilians as the target of bombings or stabbings. Security forces have also fired on crowds of angry Uyghurs. This is being motivated by training videos from nearby countries, according to the Chinese government. Neighbourhoods here tend to form along ethnic lines, and our first city is no exception. It's known as Hami in Chinese, or Kumul in Uyghur. In the 1950s, Han Chinese made up 11% of the population in this province. Now, after waves of government-sponsored migration, they account for around half of those living here. Some critics say it's a deliberate attempt to outnumber the locals. For us, it won't be long till Chinese security is on our tail, so we head straight to a predominantly Uyghur street. People come here to buy the traditional clothing that's still popular in everyday attire. Machines have replaced hand weaving, but the designs have been passed down for generations. Hi, hello. This Uyghur family business has benefited from an $18,000 grant from the government 
and we're told the town is getting more prosperous. But what sort of a place is it becoming? The Uyghurs are Turkic-speaking Sunni Muslims who've been ruled by local warlords, Chinese emperors and Mongolian raiders with only brief tastes of independence. They're a welcoming people. Yeah, that's fresh. <laughs> it's good though. It's good when it's fresh. Yeah, it's really cool. Nice. <laughs> These days, if a Uyghur travels beyond their hometown, this draws the immediate attention of the police. So it doesn't take long for a foreign TV crew to be well and truly on the radar of the local security apparatus. <laughs> Police say we'll need special permission to be here working. In this country, you can feel it when you're about to be followed quite a bit. We're allowed to leave, and though the stretches between towns are long, the roadblocks ahead have been told we're coming. We're pulled over and our car is confiscated. We have to move all our gear into a police-provided vehicle. They claim our driver doesn't have the right paperwork to ferry people around and want us to move on to the next town without him. They seem to have him on a technicality, but when they tell us that our translator has to go with them as well, as a witness, we decide to draw a line. They cave in and allow our translator to travel with us after he provides a statement. Our next town, Shanshan or Pichan in Uyghur, sits at the foot of enormous sand dunes. They spread for thousands of kilometres and would be dangerous to get lost in. It's more than 40 degrees here, so I go to buy some beer with five government minders following me. We're told they're here to help and we'll be helping every time we leave our hotel. Sure enough, next morning, when we try to leave and film, there's a welcoming committee on hand. No need for a taxi, we're told, because our official friends will take us. They say we're in breach of procedures for not having formally applied to conduct interviews here. If we're in the middle of the road, 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 we're in the middle of the road
，我想采访他们，他们接受，他们同意接受采访，这个有什么问题吗？他们不同意采访。Yet apparently the special procedures don't extend to filming the scenery. So soon we're off to see this town's most famous attraction. These massive dunes used to attract travellers in much greater numbers, yet many have been scared off by the recent tensions. Well, have a look at this, eh? Away from the cameras, travel companies say numbers have halved amongst foreigners, with a drop-off of up to 90% amongst Chinese tourists. Even this is a sensitive subject. We'd love to be able to speak to both Uyghurs and Han Chinese about what it's like living here, but that is absolutely not going to be permitted by local government officials. The funny thing is, if you were able to do those interviews, you'd get all manner of views. Some people would be unhappy with the situation, especially Uyghurs. But, you know, you'd get others who think that there is development here and the place is improving. Day three in Xinjiang, and we're being driven to the next place by our minders. They're keen to make us somebody else's responsibility, and don't really care what we do, as long as we're not doing it in their jurisdiction. Hello. Hello. Oh, hi. We arrive in Turpan and can barely leave the car before a new team of smiling officials is upon us. Here, even by Chinese standards, the tailing will be remarkable. Oh, this is interesting. Those guys have been following us here. They come again. We're about to get in the lift. You notice our friends are just even in the foyer of this hotel following us around. And sure enough, in they come. One, two, and three. At any time of the day or night, the corridor of our hotel floor is like a busy street, with the same ten or eleven young men desperately trying to act as if it's normal to hang around outside our rooms. One man leaves his surveillance notes on our movements where we can spot them. Number one went into number two's room. Number two back to his room. Number three and number four went out together, and so on. It might seem ridiculous to try and deny that these men have been sent to follow us. But our top shelf party loyalist will at least give it a go. We also ask for help to line up an interview with an imam. And to our great surprise, one is organised. The guests from our hotel follow us there in convoy as well. We meet Imam Ahmed Rozi, and he welcomes us into his 90-year-old mosque. In Xinjiang, the government keeps a close eye on religious institutions. And can veto appointments. 
In this province, veils for women and beards for men are actively discouraged by the authorities. We ask if people are free to practice their religion. We also ask why so much killing has occurred recently, especially Uyghurs killing Han Chinese. Could it be because some Uyghurs are not satisfied with their lives? A team of government officials records every word the Imam says. His can be a dangerous job. An Imam will get into big trouble if he questions the Communist Party's handling of things. But being too close to the authorities can also be deadly. In July this year, in another city, an Imam seen as too pro-government was stabbed to death in a political assassination. We ask why this might have happened. This Imam certainly has a difficult path to navigate. We've found a new driver and on the way to the regional capital, we pass some of the historical and economic reasons for wanting to hang on to this territory. On Xinjiang's highways, cars are now being stopped for full airport-style bag scans. The government's message, you think you can pressure us, try this for pressure. Who are you? Where are you going? How do you know each other? Soon we're in Urumqi, a prosperous city with Uyghurs in the minority and very Chinese characteristics. Most people you talk to seem to like living here, but a few months ago, the calm was smashed to pieces. You can't really tell now, but this street was once the site of a morning market. All the way along here, there were stalls selling food and the locals would come out to buy their breakfast. In May this year, that's exactly what they were doing when a couple of cars pulled up. It's not quite clear what happened next, but those inside have either thrown explosive devices out of the vehicles or set off bombs inside the cars. 39 passers-by were killed, four of the bombers died as well, though one was captured. It was a bloody attack which sent shockwaves through this community. Uyghur policeman Aina Ding Mimetamin took the dead and wounded from the bombed marketplace to hospital. In a largely Han Chinese area, most of those killed were elderly people. Many Han Chinese whose parents and grandparents were from Urumqi seem genuinely bewildered that social harmony is cracking apart here. The government's solution is integration. In one town, Uyghurs and Han Chinese are being offered generous cash handouts if they intermarry. 
teaching in the Uyghur language is disappearing in schools everywhere. And it's almost non-existent at universities. But to really test the pulse of Xinjiang, you have to head to the south, across the Taklamatan Desert. In places like Hotan, Uyghurs are still in the majority. Here, many unsophisticated but brutal attacks have meant a heavier security presence than in the north. In the south, the internet is at times totally blocked and phone texting prevented. Here we briefly shake our considerable escort and get our only opportunity to speak to a group of Uyghurs without a dozen police and other officials intimidating them. They're farmers seeking work in construction or as seasonal fruit pickers. And what do they think is causing the tension here? <laughs> so even here when we're in a, a crowd and we once you ask people about the violence, what's caused it, they a crowd who doesn't want to talk about it. They're happy to talk about their lives, but they feel obviously it's a bit too dangerous to speak about these things. Even if they're not involved, to even just to give an opinion is something that could really get you into trouble. As for possible solutions. The reason we've been hindered is to prevent comments just like these getting out. And when might the violence end? We decide to visit a village in which nearly 100 people were killed this July. Other foreign journalists have not been allowed into Ali Shihu. We're driving now to the town which has seen the largest recent violent incident and the numbers are quite staggering. According to official reports, amongst the passers-by, two Uyghurs were killed and 35 Han Chinese killed. Amongst the attackers, 59 were shot dead by police and another 215 captured by the local authorities. Now, this has been labelled like other incidents as a terrorist attack, but with numbers like this, it doesn't seem like what you would call by any definition a terrorist-type attack. It sounds like some sort of a grievance that's gotten out of hand which, and, and a mob has just attacked the local police station and the local government offices. We drive into the small village well off the main road. Most of the killing was around this government building. We're prepared to hear anything that officials have to say about what happened. We turn to make another pass and our car is pulled over. Well, here we are. It doesn't look like we're going to be able to go right down into this town. But it's interesting, it's not a very big place. What prompts 270 people to... Okay, 
Without the mysterious interviewing permit we supposedly require, we must leave none the wiser about these events. We make our way along one last long stretch of road, heading for our final destination. Then on day 10, we reach Kashgar, the city seen by many as the cultural home of the Uyghurs. Centuries ago, travellers who made it across the desert would have eyed this place with relief. Upon making it all the way to these crumbling alleyways, we must ask ourselves what we've garnered from the trip. Well, in short, it's a complex and possibly deteriorating situation with many answers yet to come. Much of the discussion about the violent clashes in Xinjiang has revolved around the question of whether or not they've been caused by international jihadist groups encouraging this behaviour or local disaffection following government policy on, say, beards or veils. But there's another theory being put about by some academics that this is really the inevitable result of what you might call a colonial type policy, where one culture subjugates another and dominates it, that this causes general unhappiness in the community and it doesn't take much for it to rise to the top. Over the past year, Uyghurs said to be involved in attacks or planning attacks have been rounded up by the dozen for execution. But the crackdown has also taken in moderate critics. Beijing-based Uyghur economist Ilham Totti was given life imprisonment last week after he simply criticised government policies in Xinjiang. If even reasoned analysis is not allowed, some China watchers are warning that Beijing could be pushing the Uyghurs straight into the hands of religious extremists. Travelling to this historic city, it's fair to say that we've been harassed unrelentingly all the way. But at the end of our journey, we can put Xinjiang behind us. Yet for people who live here, this is their daily life experience. And there's no indication that that's about to change in a hurry.